If you could magically make all the guns disappear with the wave of a wand, like magically, boom, all the guns are out. Would you do it? If I could make all the guns in the world go away with the wave of a wand. Uh, I would definitely not make guns disappear. Um, it's a good question. Um, my first go-to would be to say yes, because um, I think the world would just be a better place, be more peaceful. I think there'd be less killings. No. You need protection. Some people need protection. Some people feel safer with it. No, I don't think I would do that. If I had the power to make all guns magically disappear, I wouldn't do it. Um, no, I probably wouldn't make all the guns disappear. Whether it's uh, uh, gun versus gun, bomb versus bomb, knife versus knife, I mean, a weapon is the weapon, and I think it just comes down to uh, uh, intent and getting it in the right people's hands. However, at the same point in time, I would have to think about people who maybe are not able to adequately defend themselves. You know, those people, I guess, I would say that they do have the right then to have a gun, carry it on themselves, and be able to protect themselves with a gun. Whether it be for hunting or for protection, uh, it's essential. I've actually posed this question quite often whenever I'm talking to people about firearms, their aversion to them, their hatred for them, or their or even those that are considered themselves positive. I don't believe in the notion that getting rid of all the guns on the planet would instantly make things better. I think the people who we are worried about, people who are in the business of, of, uh, of taking people's lives, those aspects of things aren't necessarily gonna change. The way that they execute them will. The one thing that provided an even playing field is now eliminated. So just because we get rid of all the guns doesn't inherently make us safer. Because if I'm a criminal and I know no one has guns and there's no guns at all, all I'm gonna do is recruit some of my friends and say, hey, let's go ahead and kick in some doors. And so instead of it being one or two of us, it's gonna be five of us. And there's not much I could do against five dudes, much less a 72-year-old woman. A 72-year-old woman at home by herself with a gun is a vastly different opponent than a 72-year-old woman at home by herself without a gun. If she has a gun, she's equal to those guys, even if they do have a gun. Yeah, sure, they may all have guns at the same time, but the one thing that makes them equal is that not one of those five guys wants to die. Everyone universally understands that bullets don't have names on them. They just go wherever they're pointed. That equals the playing field. So that 72-year-old woman with a revolver in her hand puts them in a state of defense that they wouldn't otherwise be in if she was just a 72-year-old woman at home by herself without a gun. So I think people tend to underestimate how much a gun makes everyone equal in that sense or in those type of situations. 
Back in 2011, I bought a used Glock 27 from a local gun store. Unknown to me at the time, the previous owner of the gun outfitted the G27 with a Lasermax guide rod laser. I was still pretty new to guns, so this was a huge deal for me. Over time, as I learned more and dove deeper and deeper into the tactical abyss that is the online gun community, I drifted away from lasers because all the cool kids in forums and articles and videos were undermining the utility of a laser on your gun as if only noobs wanted lasers on their guns because of what they saw in movies. Admittedly, it's pretty much true. A lot of people get their ideas and beliefs about guns from what they see in movies and what they hear in music. If I were writing a text message, that last line would have been followed by that one emoji with his hands in the air and the darkest complexion I could find. It's now 2017, and I'm a lot wiser, developed my own informed opinions on many things, and today I want to make the case for lasers. Well, laser guide rod lasers to be exact. A laser doesn't make you a better shooter any more than cruise control makes you a better driver. Well, except for adaptive cruise control. Now that's the shit. Hell, in the age of pervasive texting and driving, it actually might make you a better driver. In the case of the laser, as a good friend of mine put it, a laser gives you the finer ability to take an accurate shot. Long story short, if all your other mechanics are trash, your shot will be too. That being said, if I had to take a well-placed shot from 20 to 25 yards and had to choose between my iron sights or my guide rod laser, which was sighted in at 20 to 25 yards, please believe I'm gonna go with the laser. Back when I used to play basketball a lot, there was always that one guy on the court who would overplay your strong hand, exposing any weaknesses you had going to your weak hand. The good players always learned from that and took steps to make their weak hand stronger. In more ways than not, the laser does the same thing for not so optimal trigger press and control. Using a laser during dry fire practice will immediately expose any weaknesses in your trigger control and ability to hold your sight on target in ways that your stock sights can't. For someone who struggles with trigger control, this is invaluable to me because I can't cheat my way through a dry fire practice if I'm using a laser because it will expose me immediately. Look, on the surface, and I know this may sound cocky, but hear me out, the vast majority of people learn about guns from the media. In most movies, they treat guns with lasers like death rays. I've literally heard conversations between people talking about how they can't miss shooting with a laser. Thus, I think there's something to be said about the idea there may be some psychological effect on a criminal who largely gets his information on guns from movies when they're confronted with a citizen with a gun fitted with a laser. Visually, that's got to be a little intimidating. I remember watching in India as Angelina Jolie curve bullets around people, cars, and corners, and almost making it look possible in real life. However, reality dictates that to shoot around corners accurately, you have to be behind the gun to see your sights. Well, the laser in some ways mitigates that necessity. Now, I'm not suggesting that a laser allows you to curve bullets, but it does give you the ability to expose as little of yourself as possible if you have to take a shot from around the corner or make it easy to take an accurate shot while you're in a less than ideal position physically. Here's the thing, with a guide rod laser, you don't have anything to lose. That is, if you have the money to buy one and you don't have any issues changing out your guide rod, the LaserMax guide rod laser is completely unintrusive to the gun. Hell, when I bought a G27, I didn't even know it had a laser guide rod until I pushed the takedown button. You don't have to change anything. You can use all the same accessories, all the same holsters. If you want to run night sights, you still can. You want to run an RMR? You still can. You want to put lights on your gun? You still can. And if time comes and you don't want to use a laser, just turn it off and use the gun as normal. I'm not saying the laser is better than this or that. I'm just saying it gives you options without any sacrifices. And in a world where two is one and one is none, and being prepared and having options is critical, to me, the Laser Max Guide Rod is a no-brainer if price and changing out the guide rod isn't an issue for you. You will fire six rounds. So if you've been watching the Noir Team Challenge this season, then you're familiar with this next guy. He's a lead instructor for NRA Carry Guard and previously served as a Green Beret with the U.S. Army Special Forces. See how I can pull the slide back? He's trained foreign military, police units, and U.S. Special Forces units, as well as everyday folks like you and me.
I was U.S. Army Special Forces, uh, so I was a Green Beret. That gave me not only the firearms foundation, but also gave me the ability to hone my personal protection and situational awareness skills, uh, which is a lot of what I do um, today. Do you find that some of the things have just become instinctual and that you, you do without even realizing it? Absolutely. Things do become ingrained and a little bit instinctual. But at the same time, I definitely learned that your habits do die. Um, six or eight months after I got out of the Army, I think I went to a Home Depot one day and went in and grabbed a couple things. I really couldn't recall how many people, you know, I even interacted with or what were the cars around me in the parking lot. And it just kind of hit me that everything that I took for granted is no longer being ingrained in me because I'm not really practicing it on a daily basis. You know, so for someone like me and, and, you know, general civilians, you know, what realistically do you think we could do to kind of shorten that time period between that gap of internalizing the reality of the situation and then being able to act on it? Simply the best thing that you can do um, to shorten that gap is to run your mind through these scenarios. When you came in here and sat down today, you know, you've been here for five minutes, just visualize somebody coming in that door, visualize gunfire starting to happen. But if someone's just sitting in the car, their car's off, they're not on their phone, definitely keep your distance from that vehicle. This area right here is particularly dicey because we've got three blind spots fairly close to us. If I can prematurely get my hand, you know, into that pouch, you know, just while I'm walking to my car, yeah. you know, hey, it might look a little bit strange, but I've got my hand on oh, a right firearm right. right now, you know? Yeah. So that's gonna save me time, that's possibly gonna save my life. You know, there's sometimes you can find yourself in a situation and your instinct, internal instincts are going off, where, like, say, your spidey senses go off, so to speak. Do you always listen to your gut? Is it something that you kind of have to learn how to modulate in terms of, OK, this may be unfounded, and then how much of it do I actually pay attention to? If something doesn't look right, we, we say, you know, just doesn't look right, you know, JDLR. Let that tell you something, you know? You're rolling down the street, car just rolls up, stops. You know, my brother, that happened to him. Dude walks out, gets out with a gun. Problems with a gunpoint. Like, what are you going to do? So that is where all this other situational awareness training we're talking about is really going to pay off. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to react drastically. Yeah. It could be something as simple as you just diverting or crossing the street. I call it nope. <laughs> I call it the nope situations, where it's kind of like, like, for instance, I had a friend tell me they were in a movie theater, and a guy looked really fishy, walked in with a backpack, was sitting down, and did a couple of weird things. And then I was like, he stayed through the entire movie? Like, at a certain point, my mind would have went, You're like, nope. nope. Yeah, and I was got exactly. up and I would have left. <laughs> like, no, totally. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a great example. And all too often, people are just, they just are like, no, I'm sure it'll be OK. You know, oh, I'm sure it's yeah. nothing. It's surprising how often people just don't see the potential bad, you know, that could happen from a given situation. A lot of people ask me about traveling with firearms because each airline has their own policies. I go online and look at what their policy is as far as flying with the firearm. And then from there, you can generally get a gauge of what to expect. So with handguns, the way I typically try to plan it out is I have to account for an extra 30, 35 to 40 minutes on my flights because one, I have to check in because I can't just carry on. Two, you never know what issues you may encounter. So you may get someone who kind of freaks out about it, or they may have a process that you've never experienced before, and it takes even longer. Or you have eight, nine, ten people who are also traveling with firearms, and sometimes you have to take them to the TSA site, and then you have to stand there and wait for them to check it. So take whatever time you generally a lot for going to your flight and then add about another 35 to 45 minutes. So, generally speaking though, most airlines require you to have a lockbox. So, I usually travel with this box and <clears throat> that's usually where I keep all of my, my guns. I carry, I, I have a carry gun and I have what I call my bedside gun. My carry gun typically is gonna be a smaller gun that I know I can carry. Right now I have my Glock 43. And so on top of that, what I would also have is, I'd have what I call a bedside gun, which is basically a bigger gun with a higher capacity that, you know, when I'm staying in hotels or whatnot, it allows me to one, have a light, have more capacity in the gun, and I can keep that by the bedside. Or it's a gun I keep, or as I call it, my backpack gun. This is the gun that sits in the back because I'm generally gonna be running with a smaller gun. Now, as far as ammo is concerned, um, they usually want you to keep it in the original box or some type of 
self-contained container. They don't like loose rounds. Like you can't just have like a paper bag and just throw rounds in a paper bag. So typically what I like to do is just get like some of these cases from like the gun store. Um, I think this holds about 100 rounds of nine millimeter. And so I keep all my, my self-defense rounds in here. And then I put this in my check bag as well. And so typically this is what an arrangement looks like for me whenever I'm traveling with my firearms. I've always been intrigued with people who are able to make a living off the land. Those types of individuals could go off the grid and not even blink an eye. I mean, let's face it, I'm much more at home in a high rise than I am in the lowlands. I got a glimpse into the other side when I spent an afternoon shooting with NRA's Josh Powell. He's never happier than when he has a shotgun in his hand. He's an avid duck hunter and a masterclass sporting clay shooter. So we were doing some talking the other day. You do a lot of clay shooting. I do very little clay shooting. So I figured we'd come out here and he'd teach me some clay shooting. Yeah, one of the biggest differences between shooting you know, black rifles or handguns is that you're you're not aiming a, a shotgun. Yeah. And I think that it's much more akin to golf, frankly, okay. than shooting, you know, your AR. Let's go shoot some. Let's do it. Pull. Where were you looking? At the target and the actual front sight. Right. Yeah. So just look at that target. Okay. Pull. All right, now, you Man went back into, you're in a big hurry, yeah. right? You're like, <laughs> and then you're not looking at the target. You give yourself time to connect to that target. Okay. If you're not connected, you're not gonna hit it. I'm gonna tear that whole sight off there because you don't need my it. Eye, my eyes are like glued to it, it's like. <laughs> Do we have pliers? Let's Ooh. get some pliers. It's like a visual tunnel hole. All I, when I pull the shotgun up to my arm, all I see is that green fiber optic. Voila, pull. That's what I'm talking about. How about that? All right, that's good. And I didn't know what my barrel was doing. There you go. That, I've never said that to you, but you figured it out. No. What that gun's doing out there, it does, it's just waving around. It's all here. Pull. Yep. Look at, I mean. So right there, Yeah. I tried to really relax and slow down. Yep. And then there was a moment where I was like, herp and shoot it, herp and shoot it. Um, and well, let me ask you this part. Visually, when you did that yeah. and you went through that, I'm assuming that it looked really big. Yeah. And then the target got smaller. Yep. And then it got a little bigger. Yeah. After I actually was able to pull myself back and relax. Right. Then it was like, okay, boom. I'm becoming familiar with the discomfort. Perfect. Yeah. That's a great answer. So let's have fun now. How about we do a one two report? Let's do it. Let's do it. Pull. Oh, nope. You shot it! <laughs> <laughs> that was instinctive. <laughs> that bird came out like a quarter. It broke, yeah. but you just went up with your eyes and pulled the trigger. Yeah. That's shooting a shotgun. That is really instinctive, though. I mean, look at how far you came and, you know, yeah. I don't know how long we've been doing this, 30 <laughs> minutes? That's awesome. So this is a Pro Series Mossberg 930. It was a gun designed by Mossberg essentially to fill a bunch of different roles, whether it be hunting, shooting clay, self-defense, you name it. I really like the gun. It's, it's, it's kind of one of those like one size fits all options for just kind of a family or somebody who's kind of on a budget, who's looking for a really good shotgun for the price. What's the other gun? I don't know. Don't ask me about that one. <laughs> it's an over under, uh, kind of a more traditional style break over shotgun. Um, that's about as much as I know about this particular gun, to be honest with you. Can we shoot some real quick? I mean, I'm never against shooting. Pull. 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 It stands out. I like the balance of it. Something about the balance, and I think the way I cheek it feels kind of good. I didn't think, I didn't expect for it to feel this good because this gun felt really good in my hand. So I'm just going to keep going until I miss. Now I'm going to miss. Watch. Pull. I'm not going to lie, I kind of like this. <laughs> Josh is an insanely great shooter, and since he's had such a successful day of hunting, we took full advantage of that and had a real farm-to-table fresh quail dinner. Tony Macris joined us for the evening, and if you're a fan of hunting, you've no doubt heard of Tony Macris. He's the host of Under Wild Skies, a popular big game hunting show that airs on the Outdoor Channel. 
You can watch past seasons of the long running series by browsing under Wild Skies catalog on NRATV.com. This is a great country if you're an outdoorsman. This area was settled in the late 1600s, early 1700s. And so people have been living in this low country on this water and being fishermen and oystermen and hunters and duck hunters and all sorts of, of living on the land. Mm -hmm. And you know, those were days before you had you know, uh, um, you know, fancy grocery stores with package. So whatever they were gonna eat, they had to either plant or catch. And so, so this would be the this were farm to table tonight. Yeah, you so got you got <laughs> you got grits, which is would have been locally grown corn. You got turnips, you know, but they grew all that sort of thing, and and, and they supplemented the protein with something they either killed or caught. It's kind of a way of life down here. The funny thing is how you know a lot of people always talk about guns only serving one purpose, and I'm completely outside of my element right now. Mm -hmm. But what do you mean? In terms of like I'm a city boy. Right? I mean, like, if you look at our body language, just on that alone, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Y'all got you relax, you chill. You, I mean, you're at home. Every noise I hear, I'm like, what is that? You know. But at the same time, you know, and I always say this: the gun actually serves as a catalyst for me appreciating the outdoors mm -hmm. in a way that I never would have been able to. I like to call it reality for me, <laughs> like what we need to be. A lot of people on the other side think that we evolve past or progress past this type of lifestyle. The irony is, if everything were to go to shit tomorrow, it would devolve into this. And I don't mean devolve in a, as a pejorative, but just it will come back to, the, this is this is the foundation um, in terms of what our lives would essentially be like. If you're gonna eat, you better be able to hunt. And if you weren't able to hunt, you're probably not gonna make it. And when I look at all the people that criticize it or don't understand it, which is usually the same, yeah. you, know, you don't know what this was about. I mean, you can measure the, the advance of early man from when they stopped you know, eating bugs and berries and nuts and whatever they could find, and they started hunting together. That's where language came from. That's where tools came from. That's where coordination came from. That's where moving together came from. Now, we know we can all go to a grocery store nowadays and buy food, but it feels a little better and it feels, you know, much more enjoyable yeah. to know that you went out and shot these quail today and fixed them and everything that we're eating is local. I mean, when I sit with my kids and we're, we're, you know, we tend to eat a fair amount of game in our family, I think we spend a little bit more time appreciating what we're eating at that time. Completely. I think in, in a sense, it's what, what it's also done is <laughs> kind of highlighted my, my inadequacies. <laughs> In the sense of, if you would have dropped me in an environment like this, I couldn't survive. And I'm laughing about it, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, that's kind of pathetic. Because I've been hunting all my life. I first went to Africa in 18, in 19, 18, 1999. I know you can laugh, say 1899. But, no. <laughs> but in 1999, if you'd have dropped me over there mm -hmm. without the, the tribesmen, the bushmen that I was hunting with, I wouldn't have made it either. But there's a, there's a culture to it. There's a, right. and you know, we talked about it before. There's, 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 a, there's a, almost a romance. There is a sort of romance around it, but there's also a sense of that this is who we are. Yeah. This is in our DNA. This is the way we were brought up. You know, you talk about being connected in nature. Mm -hmm. You know, as a hunter, you're not going to a refuge. You're not going to a state park. You're going out somewhere <laughs> where you got to kind of get to. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of muddy and dirty. It's not on the map, and and that's nature.
You're going to hear an initial action, but you're going to wait for a second action. Copy that. Okay. Stand by. Camera speed. All right, guys, we're talking about the unconventional draw. Obviously, we're in a movie theater, and it's a very likely place to be able to be in a situation where you might have to draw your gun. And we've all been in a movie theater and thought to ourselves, what action would we take if somebody walked into that movie theater right now? Like we always talk about, everything we do needs context, whether it's in training or reality. You go to a range and you shoot on a static environment at a 90 degree angle from the target. You draw your gun and shoot, and that's the A plus answer. But that's not what reality is. And chances are, if a threat does pop up, the environment is gonna be extremely dynamic and you're probably gonna find yourself in a position that you didn't expect to be in. That's why we make ourselves uncomfortable in training in order to recognize these things and adapt to our environment. There's three things that we wanna take away from this scenario while we break this down. Unorthodox positioning, blending in, and finding concealment. The first one of unorthodox positioning is getting into positions that we didn't expect to be in that are gonna be uncomfortable. In this situation in the theater, I was having to orient towards a threat, identify it, and draw all while trying to move my feet in about a two feet space in front of me with other seats around. The second thing is blending in, and especially if we conceal carry, we do not wanna draw unnecessary attention to ourselves if we have to be the good guy in that situation and deploy a firearm. You don't wanna be standing there all stoic like a superhero and drawing attention to yourself. In order to do that, we need to blend in with what the environment is doing, with what the people are doing around us. If everybody's reacting or acting in a certain way, we need to be a part of that blending process as we're continually taking in our environment and applying as much situational awareness as possible. Just because everyone's jumping on the floor doesn't mean I'm gonna take my eye off what the threat's doing. I can still move to a different level below the chair and still keep my eye on what the threat's doing. Blending in is a huge part of concealment, and that's our third thing. You're concealing yourself in that environment to not draw attention to you. There's no reason that I can't conceal myself behind one of those chairs or whatever my environment is giving us in order to get the firearm out online and do it effectively. So while I'm blending in and finding concealment, I'm still taking in what's going on in my environment and putting myself in the best position possible. That way I'm exposing myself as little as possible using the concealment of the back of the seats to my advantage. That way, instead of seeing this big profile of a guy drawing a gun on you, all you see is a sliver of a head that you're probably not even gonna be looking at because you're looking at bigger targets. You're looking at big flashy movements. All these three things wrapped up together gives us an advantage in the fight if we were to need them. Stand by. That's two seconds. And action. Sending. When facing away from a threat that's actively shooting in this scenario, the priority is to orient towards the threat to gain awareness, identify their location, and take action if necessary. The first step is to rotate my body as quick as possible by positioning my right foot to prep my legs to turn. Once my feet start moving, I can begin to rotate my body. I start my draw with one hand until my lead hand rotates enough to assist clearing my shirt material out of the way. Once clear, I establish a three-finger grip and start my draw. The second my pistol clears the holster, I drop my elbow and immediately bring my gun up into my focal plane, meeting it at center chest to establish a two-handed grip. Once I establish my stable shooting platform, I simultaneously keep a low profile to stay concealed while leaning to find a good lane to take a shot through. Target ID is critical with a large crowd in a confined space. Previously on the Noir Team Challenge. Welcome to the Season 6 Noir Shooting Challenge. Let's talk about the first course of fire. Teams will be determined based off of this first course. Now, let's meet our contestants. My name is Barrett Fawbush. A lot of people know me as Alex Zedra. My name's Nicole Arell. Thea Van Sight. I'm Darren Lasort. I'm calling on Noir. Once you hit me with you, miss, you're done. That kind of changed the perspective of me a little miss. bit, right? I was treating a crossbow differently than I would Ooh. a firearm. I would never load my rifle and then run in front of it. From there, we will team up shooters 
Barrett and Nicole. I like it. I like it. Mr. Noir, everybody. Your teammate is Mr. Darren Lasort. We've got Alex and Thea. Hi. I like it. Let's talk about Course of Fire number two. It involves possibly all four different types of weapons platforms. I honestly believe that this entire course is not going to be determined by speed. It's going to be determined by who does not freak out. Wait, do you have any shotgun ammo? Shit. The one round that I had to run all the way back here for because I missed the shot on the star. I figured I was going to be the one up there. And when you say I shoot Texas stars all the time, I'm like, oh, heck, I got this in the bag. So after our first two courses of fire, in first place, we've got Team Bravo. Course three is a friendly game of horse, or in this case, gun. Exactly. They're going to get a U, and then they're going to get an N. So they're going to be out first, and then we have to do Here's this guy? Yeah. Ah! You know what's awesome about this right now? Everyone's getting tired. Oh, I don't get tired. Yeah, OK. What letter is that, Barrett? G. G. That's what a group looks like, Coleon. G-U-N. OK, I'm not positive that you hit the target. A very no. loud sound. It doesn't matter. They, they hit it. Let's go. This round, yeah. I G promise you we're going to beat you. G oh. Competition. Stage four is a fun one involving pistol, shotgun, and a truck tire. So I think roll the tire for 15 seconds and then shoot like some bit. Slow it down. I don't even have enough mags that I'm going to put into that steel target. I think we underestimated how hard that was going to be. Oh, yeah. Oh. The only thing difficult that I see that's going on is your ability to get the gun back up and run. Crack it. It won't rack. Yes, it will. Crack it. She told me when to pull the trigger, and I pulled it on her mark. I'll tell you when to shoot. Three, two, three. I think it's the best shot of the, of the cops so far. Team Alpha, Team Bravo, you guys tied, so we're gonna have, a, have his tiebreaker. Last time he rushed his shotgun, he missed. <laughs> uh, ego. Course of Fire 5 is inspired by the crazy gun laws of Washington, D.C. We have a D.C. zone. In that zone, you cannot possess guns, ammo, or magazines. The shooter will run either around the DZ with extra ammo for the next station, or they can run through the DZ without extra ammo. The penalty of missing one of those plates is just too great. Running all the way around this thing, I mean, it's crazy. So Barrett, you flew through that sucker at a quick pace. Well, if you just say F it and just run straight there, F the bag, F the bag, F the bag. In this next course of fire, we're a pretty cool course of fire. One shooter is going to dip their hands in the ice water, while the other shooter runs back, grabs up to four ammo cans. Wow, three in one hand. Iceman will dig through the ammo cans in search of a 10 round magazine in which they will shoot a piece of steel five times. The person who ran the ammo cans will fire two crossbow shots into the crossbow target. Team Charlie, fastest time by 10 seconds. Damn, yeah! like that. The standings as of now. Team Alpha, 12 points. Team Bravo, 13 points. Team Charlie, right there, 10 points. 10 points. It's a tight game. It's literally coming down to the last bit here. Season six, Noir Shooting Challenge. The last course of fire is here. <laughs> I think we're all ready for it, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's going to be an exciting moment. Bring on five more. Let's talk about this last course of fire. I have here in my hands a Mossberg MVP Pro Varmint, bolt action, 308. We'll be shooting the Federal Premium 175 grain Sierra Match King gold medal match bullet. One shooter from the team will be shooting at distances of three, five, or 700 yards in one minute. That person will accumulate hits on steel, and they will accumulate time with each hit. Half a second at the 300, a full second for every hit on 500, and two seconds for every hit on the 700-yard target. The time that Shooter 1 accumulates will be used by Shooter 2 on their carbine on the 75-yard range from what is now an unknown distance. Shooter 2 will then shoot chalk. Every chalk hit is worth one point, as in the points that you guys have accumulated over the last three days. Wait, are there going to be balloons on these? There is no balloons. Oh, thank God. <laughs> so literally, anybody can come back and win at this point. Wow. The amount of time that Shooter 1 gets you, Shooter 2 will appreciate. Each team will get three minutes of dry fire practice. They can use that three minutes however they want. This rifle is zeroed for 300 yards. What questions do we have? So there is no, there is no winner. It's just how many points you can accumulate at this point. Correct. So there will not be a winner for the stage. We will tally on the, the total number of points you get from the chalk to your scores, which up until this point are Bravo team, 13 points. 
Alpha team, 12 points. Charlie team, 10 points. So there's only a three-point gap at best right there. Wow. Anyone's game. Wow, okay. Good questions. Let's do some dry fire. All right. Yep. Thanks. Wow. So, Inc, your three minutes starts now. Thank you. Oh, we're not gonna have the magazine in there, right? The magazine will be in it there. It will be in there. It's as simple as this. Just drop it in. Okay? Okay. I'm gonna have to have at least two or three seconds. I can't just, you know, not shoot Shaw. I can't have a half a second or zero seconds to shoot Shaw. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, I definitely could not do this. Okay. Shit, no. I'll just throw it in there and, yeah, just throw it in there. Okay. And the five is clean, and it's the large circular gong at five. Work the action for me. Go ahead and uh, put the bolt forward. Okay, safety's gonna be off. Yep, safety's just gonna stay off. Okay. Can I like, if I'm loading for her, can I hold the ammo in my hand or does yep. it have to be on the You can table? hold it in your hand. Now look for your round, where's your round? Now yep. find your round, where's your round at? Okay. If they're gonna be loose, you're gonna come in, they're gonna drop in. Are you gonna load it in there for me or are you gonna hand it to me? Whichever you want, I'll do whatever you want. Just load it in there. Okay. So if you've never shot a bolt gun before. <laughs> and so it's the biggest gong, so of the three visible gongs, it's the one on the left? With the orange, yes. Now, you see how you're breathing and your body's working with the crosshair, yeah. right? Better off you can do to just stay as calm as possible or have a little shoulder on, on the gun as possible, the better you're gonna do as well. When you go to load it, try not to hit the table because it affects okay. the sights like tremendously. Are you starting at 300? Yes. So find 300 real fast. Find 300 in the scope. Okay. Find 500 in the scope. Find 500, hurry. Okay. Find 700. All right, y'all, time is up. You can use the rag to help even out, you know, an unlevel bipod. Use the shooting bag to help you out. Stage the ammo however you want. Team Sloth, hey, you know it's on you. Stand by! Feed it, go ahead. Go. Okay, go. Hit! Ro rack, rack, rack. I need you to go a little bit faster for me, okay? 300 again, 300 again. Hit! Bracket. All right, I want you to go to 500 now, okay, girlfriend? You're doing great, you're doing great. Go to five. She's going to five? Got it. Hold on that mill. Bracket. Miss. I think you it was high. I think it was high, I'm looking. A little high. Okay, it was high. take that center crosshair and just take it very slightly above where you were shooting. Bracket. Low right. Low right. Low and right. We're gonna go back on the 300, okay? That's where we're gonna work it. We're gonna go back on the 300, and we're gonna sit there and work it all day long, okay? Going you got to the this. three. Rack it. Hit! Rack it. Let's go, let's go. I need you to rack it. Let's go, you're doing great. You're doing great, girlfriend. Get... Right. Okay, you're good. Good work. Solid work. <laughs> what do you think we did? Well, we did three hits so at 300, so we got a second and a half. Team Alpha. You ready for this? Ready. Last course of fire. Last course of fire. Last, course. Last chance to hopefully pull out a victory, okay? You guys have 1.5 seconds. That was three hits on the 300 yard target. That's right. Good That's win. all we need to win. All right, let's see it. Thanks. Get that shot. Thanks, buddy. Team Alpha, you have 1.5 seconds to shoot as many pieces of chalk as you can. Shooter ready. Ready. Stand by. Got two. Nice. Nice. All right. Nice job, guys. Thanks, buddy. Nice. Good job. <laughs> I'll wait for it. Hit your teammate first. Yep. You're good. Thanks, buddy. Thea, Alex, Team Charlie. Eyes and ears, going hot. Shooters ready. Stand by. Hit! Hit!
Head! High, just high off the left side. Just left of center, high. Hit! High, high right. One o'clock position. That was a miss. Hit! Nice job, Alex. Something she needed. Nice. Good job. Team Charlie. Last course of fire. You have two and a half seconds to shoot as many pieces of chalk as you can. That is thanks to Alex getting awesome hits at 300, five hits. Now you need to live up to your end and hit some chalk. You got this. Two and a half seconds, as much chalk as you can. All right. Sound good? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's see what you can do. Load and make ready. Using your red dot or your irons? I'm using the irons. OK, cool. OK. Team Charlie, you have two and a half seconds to shoot as many pieces of chalk as you can. Shooter's ready. Stand by. One hit. Nice one. job. Good job. Good job, Theo. Thanks. At least I got one. Bravo team. Stand by. Go. Oh. oh, shit. I didn't know what that was. Hit. Hit! 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 You have eight seconds. Six. Miss! Five. Low, Four. slightly left. Three, two, one. The shoot. Uh, dude, thanks, that was fighting. That was, was fighting. Fight it there at last. Team Bravo. Thanks yeah. to Darren's uh, super fast sniper skills. <laughs> You got eight hits, man. Thanks, I appreciate it. So thanks to that, you guys have four seconds. Nice. You have four seconds, Collins, to hit as many pieces of chalk as you can from 10 yards. All right. <laughs> it's a lot of time, man. Get some hits. So, uh, all right, brother, crush it. Two to win. Load Two to win. Make ready. Shooter ready. Stand by. No, oh, but he got it. <laughs> You got two. All right, brother. It was nice, good. Nice job, Nice guys. work. Nice work. Thank you. Pop those rounds off. Woo! <laughs> Shooters, season six, Noir Shooting Challenge. Coming to an end here. Oh, Unfortunately. Insane. Everyone's like, no, and I'm like, yeah, you sleep. Lots of heat to celebrate not having to be in, but it was fun. Let's talk about that last course of fire, course of fire number seven. Thea, Team Charlie, you only had two and a half seconds. It's not very much time. Nope, <laughs> not at all. OK, this, this course is interesting because it's about precision. And so it's like Alex only had a minute, and she either had to shoot 300, 500, or 700 yards. And if that's just like so hard to like make long distance shots in such a short period of time. And then however many shots she makes, that dictates how much time I get. So I only had two and a half seconds. And that's a short period of time to hit a whole bunch of little one and a half inch pieces of chalk. Like, that was rough. That was tough. You did manage to hit one piece of chalk. <laughs> one piece. You got a point, got a point for the team. How'd it feel? Um, it felt pretty good to hit one. 
Would have been rushed. better to hit two. Oh, yeah, Gold <laughs> Rush. Four. I like yeah. two and a half seconds. Go, go, like, go. Oh, man. <laughs> Bravo. Team Spotted Owl. Yeah. I mean, it's always going to be an automatic decision as to who shoots the uh, semi-automatic versus the bolt action. The bolt action's old. Uh, of course, that's what I'm going to shoot. It's gonna be <laughs> Before you even told us the course, I was like, you're on bolt. Yeah, he's on it, yeah. Well, it paid off because, Darren, you had eight hits. That gave Collins four seconds, hitting two pieces of chuck. Nice. Should have freehanded it, honestly. Yep. Yeah? Yeah. Could have moved faster? Yeah, just because I thought, OK, stabilizing on the, on the table would be better, but it actually slows you down. And so it, the, the recoil comes up through the rifle, mm -hmm. and so it, I'm looking for the reticle, whereas I'm more used to just more of a fluid, and fluid you guys motion. Now, if it was in the gr if you were if we were prone in the ground, it'd be a different story because there's not much there's not much movement. But against that wood with that magazine, your elbows, there's just a little too much. A lot of movement. Too much movement going on for sure. Team Alpha, you're moving pretty quick. You only had 1.5 seconds. That's right. And you managed to hit two pieces of chalk. I did. That was that's pretty good. That was, pretty that, was, that was awesome. So you guys got two points on that. You know, you didn't have a whole lot of time, but you had some time. You had enough time to hit two. So thanks to Nicole on the long gun. That's right. Let's see where that puts us. Yeah, Alex, Team Charlie, you guys gained one, so it puts you at 11. Team Bravo, you guys gained two, putting you at 15 points. Nice. And Team Alpha, you guys gained two, puts you at 14. All right, Second brother. place for you guys. First place. <laughs> yeah. Nice work, guys. Are. That was fun. That was fun. Thank you, Barrett. I appreciate hey, that. Guys, that was incredible. It's been a great pleasure working with you all for three days. I, you know, this side of bit is fine. I kind of wish I was on your end of yeah, it. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've seen That'd you hard. shoot. Yep. I've seen you shoot, so stay over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't want to run up against you. All right, guys. That was awesome. Thanks, Thank you. Nice job. Fun times, fun times. Nice. Good job. Good job. This, I think the courses, this is probably the best culmination of courses that I've run since we've been doing this. Uh, Certainly the most interesting, no doubt. Yeah. I think this was probably the perfect combination in terms of athleticism and skill set and the mental acuity involved in shooting. Yeah. Um, I, I think this, this point of apex kind of serves as a catalyst for what I think the Noir Shooting Challenge can continue to grow to be. Right. Um, and I think this kind of set the barometer and the standard for what it'll continue to look like going forward. Right. Um, it goes to show how much fun you can have, how many different things you can do. I mean, literally, the opportunities, the options to have fun shooting are endless. Yeah. And what's cool is this is kind of how we perceived it the first time we talked about athletic shooting. And the Noir Challenge is a very simple situation where we have two fields of play. Mm -hmm. We have pretty simple targets. Yeah. And we just go out and have some fun. Yeah, yeah baby! I love you. I love you, Coleone! Good job, buddy. Nice work. Once enemies, <laughs> now teammates. Before you go, I want to tell you about the new drinkware that's available now at shop.mrcoleonnoir.com. Besides keeping your drinks cold for 24 hours and hot for 12 hours, they also make for a great conversation starter, are incredibly durable, and just look damn good. So click the image in the top left corner of this video or the link in the description section to order your drinkware today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel by clicking the image on the bottom left portion of this video. Oh, and almost forgot. Go ahead and hit that bell symbol on the top right portion as well of this video and get notified when I release new videos. Noir out.